to welcome you at the second day of the seventh Philosophicon, the conference that today takes place both online and in the Pedagogical University of Krakow. I am Maciej Stanek of the University of Silesia, and I have this honor to moderate our first panel today. As far as I can see, we have four speeches and five speakers scheduled for this performance. These are Cara Kennedy, Tara Smith, Eric Wilson, Rafaela Elaine Miranda, and Reinhard Joseph Uybaveta. I hope that all of them will join us. So let our first speaker speak. I'm happy to announce Cara Kennedy, who is going to give a speech entitled Spice and Ecology in Frank Herbert's Dune. Cara, go ahead, the floor is yours. Um, screen sharing is disabled for me. Is it disabled for you? Just give me a second. Mateus, can you hear us? Can you please enable? Okay. Uh, now, now it is. Great, thank you. Is that okay? Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kara, and today I'm going to be talking about spice in Dune. So my focus area is how does this spice help develop the world of Dune, and how does it also help drive home its messages about yes. ecology? Can you please enable this is a short, shortened version of um, a full paper that has just been published in Science Fiction Studies? If you're interested in reading the full version. So first of all, what is spice? Spice in Dune is also known as melange. It's considered to be the spice of spices. It's highly valuable and important in Frank Herbert's universe. Spice is an addictive substance that can only be found on the desert world of Arrakis, also known as Dune, where it's part of the sandworm life cycle. It's very expensive to mine due to the constant threat from sandworms in the harsh environment. It's often described as having a cinnamon-like odor and it's everywhere in the atmosphere of the planet and ingested by every inhabitant through the air, as well as food and drink. Spice also dominates the politics of Dune because factions vie for control over this most precious resource. It's highly valued for its use as a consciousness opener, a ceremonial toxin, and a geriatric, which is the term that Herbert uses for life extending and immunity giving properties. Its rarity makes it extremely valuable. A handful of spice can buy an entire home. And it's the key factor in the intense struggle for control of the planet between the feuding House Atreides and House Harkonnen, as well as the involvement of other groups such as the Spacing Guild and the Bene Gesserit. We also know it's important because of how often it's mentioned. Although the word melange only appears a handful of times, the word spice appears around 200 times in the book, an average of once every two to three pages. My argument is that Dune is far more than just another 1960s science fiction narrative about drugs. And it grounds the spice in relevant real world historical and social contexts to build a world in which complex themes surrounding humanity and ecology can emerge. So let's take a look at some of the key historical and social contexts of spice. Spices in general have long been val valued by humans for their uses in food and drink, medicines, and religious and ritualistic practices. And when people wanted them, this led to significant impacts on populations, cultures, and environments around the world where they could be found. In the medieval era, highly valuable spices such as pepper, cinnamon, and nutmeg were very much status symbols for the ruling class and markers of their power to purchase them, display them, and consume them. There was a European craving for spices during the Middle Ages. And spices were important not only in food, but also in medicines, incense, perfumes, and cosmetics. Spices were costly, though, and they had mysterious origins. And this led to attempts to find where they came from and to take over their trade. This helped stimulate European colonialism that ended up having a significant impact on the demography, 
politics, culture, economy, and ecology of the entire globe. Spices became an addiction, and people were willing to do anything to satisfy their cravings. Cinnamon, in particular, became one of the most highly prized and costly spices. This led to struggles for control over the areas in the east where it grew, such as the cinnamon paradise of Ceylon or Sri Lanka. In Dune, the characterization of spice as both smelling and tasting like cinnamon aids in the world building process by connecting spice to something we would be familiar with before we learn about its more fantastical properties. When characters are near spice or spice filled items, the text uses similar descriptions. The odor of cinnamon, heavy and pungent, a rich cinnamon odor from the spice, the rich smell of cinnamon, or the redolence of cinnamon. Even if we are unaware that cinnamon was once one of the most valuable spices in the real world spice trade, we will likely still be familiar with cinnamon as a common spice. In addition, although current Westerners may consider cinnamon to be a sweet spice used in desserts, it's still found in meat and seafood dishes in South Asia and the Middle East. This makes it plausible as a natural fit with the diet and the culture of the Fremen, whose characterization draws heavily on Middle Eastern cultures. The term spice and its connection to cinnamon thus allow for a more multi-layered reading than if Herbert had simply made up a new word for this substance. Paralleling the historic spice trade is a contemporary petroleum or oil trade, and both prompted European exploration to so-called exotic lands where they expanded Western interests. Spice can certainly be viewed as an analogy for oil, as critics and readers have often done. The desert and dune is one type of ecosystem that covers an entire planet, which is a way in science fiction that authors can focus attention on a specific type of environment. What are the clues that this planet is similar to the Middle East? There's the characterization of the indigenous population known as the Fremen, the use of a language derived from Arabic, and the name for the planet Arrakis sounds like Iraq. This desert cannot but help remind us as readers of the Middle East, so it becomes easier for us to recognize the similarities in the struggle for resources in such an environment and accept the world in Dune as feasible. In the post-World War II period, foreign companies had come to control a majority of the means of petroleum production and distribution in the Middle East. The local government leaders began to see the strategic value in oil and demand a higher percentage of the profits as oil increasingly became the world's major source of fuel. Because of the large concentration of oil reserves in the Middle East, it gave Gulf countries a large importance relative to their population, and it became a strategic battleground between the Eastern and Western blocs. In an attempt to reclaim more control over oil profits, in 1960, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, and Iran founded OPEC. And although it only made small gains at first, as it gained traction, it proved that there was considerable potential in forming a united front to make gains at the expense of the foreign companies. The inclusion of spice and dune as such a valuable resource in a desert ecosystem fought over by external powers contributes to the sense that, as critic Gary Canavan argues, dune ranks among the best allegorizations of US energy policy and Middle East imperialism ever achieved in science fiction. Indeed, Herbert himself suggested that the development corporation in the novel, known as Chom, is analogous to OPEC. Herbert wanted to explore the desert, but he knew that readers would expect to see something that would believably attract people to live or want to work in such a desolate environment. So he invented the valuable commodity of spice that drives the major factions to colonize Arrakis and struggle for control over spice mining and production. But spice is more than just an analogy for oil. It's also a mind altering substance that reflects the psychoactive drugs that have been used by a variety of cultures for millennia, but were popularized by the countercultural movement in the US in the 1960s and 70s. The term spice takes on a kind of euphemistic quality in Dune because it doesn't specifically say that it's the same as a real world drug, but its descriptions show that it copies the effects of hallucinogenic substances. Humans across the world seem to have a need to alter their reality, and psychoactive substances have been part of societies for a long time. The term psychoactive means of or pertaining to a substance having a profound or significant effect on mental processes. Psychoactive drugs include those that are usually legal, such as coffee, tea, tobacco, and alcohol, and those that are often illegal, such as heroin and cocaine. 
Hallucinogens comprise one of four major categories of psychoactive drugs. They include mescaline, found in certain cacti, psilocybin in magic mushrooms, and synthetics such as LSD. It's important to note that Dune anticipated some of the countercultural desire for LSD because at the time it was published, LSD was not yet widely available, and the term hallucinogen had not yet come into general use. So Herbert describes melange as an awareness spectrum, spectrum narcotic. Meanwhile, in the field of psychology, there was a shift going on. And in the 1950s and 60s, psychologists who acknowledged the limitations of the behavioral school of thought became interested in how the mind processed information, leading to the so-called cognitive revolution and the study of states of mind. American psychology also saw the emergence of what Abraham Maslow named the third force, which was an alternative to Freudianism and behaviorism that sought to study human motivation and human potential and the tendency of humans to seek growth and self-actualization. If you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the top is self-actualization. Some therapists were disillusioned with tra traditional techniques. They became interested in Zen Buddhism, existentialism, and transcendental experiences. So once the psychedelic properties of LSD were found, some psychiatrists began experimenting with it and other psychoactive drugs like psilocybin and mescaline because they're a unique effect on the human psyche of bringing into awareness forms of consciousness that are usually hidden or left unconscious. Herbert himself had some experience with hallucinogenic drugs in Mexico, but he did not advocate their use in seeking visionary experiences. What interested him was a sense of heightened awareness and how each person could experience the drug differently. So within Dune, rather than being an abstract resource akin to oil, which is valued for its role in powering machinery, spice is a concrete substance desired for the changes that it creates in the human mind and the body when it's inhaled or ingested. This kind of substance with psychedelic properties also fits in with the cultures of the desert dwellers that Herbert had in mind for the Fremen, who are based on the Native Americans of the Southwest as well as the nomadic peoples of North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, among others. Native Americans use over 100 different types of hallucinogenic plants, including peyote, mescal beans, and psilocybic mushrooms, and the Bedouin and other peoples in the Arab world are known for their use of hashish, a drug prepared from the cannabis plant. I use Mark J.P. Wolf's theory of world building as a basis for looking at how spice works to make the world of Dune believable and interesting. We can see that spice contributes to effective world building in large part because even though it's an invented substance, it's still realistic and familiar due to its grounding in these real world contexts. We've looked at parallels with the spice trade, oil in the Middle East and hallucinogenic drugs in the 20th century. All of these connections help give spice and therefore the book depth. A world must also be consistent and make logical sense. Things can't be random or seem out of place. Spice helps with this too. It brings together various threads in the world and it integrates them into a coherent whole centered on this valuable substance. Spice ties everything together. Sandworms and spice, Fremen in the desert, the great houses in Arrakis, the emperor in his throne, the guild and interstellar travel, the Bene Gesserit and their abilities, and Paul Atreides and prescience. To the Fremen, sandworms are a deity, a means of transportation, and producer of a rare substance with domestic, cultural, and economic significance. Spice facilitates their survival in the desert. They use it in their diet, religious rituals, manufacturing, as well as bribes. Yet the same spice also attracts the colonizers, the great houses, who then interfere with the Fremen's lives in varying degrees, ranging from brutal oppression to more benign tolerance. Meanwhile, the emperor, who's in charge of handing out fiefs to the nobility of the houses, has been allowed to succeed his father to the throne only on the assurance that he'd keep the spice flowing. And then the guild's loyalty to the emperor is dependent on this condition, since they need spice to guide ships through space and maintain their monopoly on transport. The Bene Gesserit too requires spice to enhance their special abilities, such as truth saying, and access the memories of their female ancestors. Their political influence and placement in high positions relies on part on such enhancements. As the offspring of the Bene Gesserit through Jessica and a product of their breeding program, Paul also gains special abilities enhanced through the spice. 
which enables him to fully open his consciousness to prescience. His dominance comes full circle in the novel to threaten the existence of Spice itself. In all of these groups, Spice is a significant component, helping tie together the logic of the world. Yet the price of the longevity and enhancement that Spice provides is addiction. Paul discovers Spice is a poison, so subtle, so insidious, so irreversible, it won't even kill you unless you stop taking it. We can't leave Arrakis unless we take part of Arrakis with us, he tells Jessica. This, has a, this sets up a noticeable irony for readers in showing that the geriatric, life-extending, consciousness-expanding spice that's so valued is actually poisonous. Addiction is signaled by a clear change in one's eyes. They turn totally blue, no whites in them. Dr. Yu explains that this is linked to saturation of the blood with melange. Mushroom scientist Paul Stamets described meeting Herbert in the early 1980s and listening to him say that he based several elements of Dune on the fungal life cycle, including the blueness of the eyes of those ingesting spice because psilocybin mushrooms also have a cerulean blue. Scholar Karen Writing notes a parallel between the blue eyes in Dune and the Tuareg peoples in North Africa who have indigo veils and clothing that sometimes leaves blue dye on their skin. The repetition of the image of blue eyes across Dune helps give the sense that spice is everywhere. It keeps returning our attention to the mind and the body and the changes that can happen naturally. Even Jessica is taken back upon seeing the Fremen's eyes, the wash of deepest, darkest blue without any white, secretive, mysterious. Paul predicts that he and his mother will live among the Fremen and acquire the blue eyes, and this prediction comes true. This physical alteration marks both off-worlders who consume large quantities of spice, as well as inhabitants of Dune, including creatures of the desert, such as bats and the people of the Fremen. It's an outward sign of being bonded to the planet, but also a marker of the trap in which they exist. The guild agents wear contact lenses to mask their blue eyes, suggesting that they desire to hide the evidence of their heavy spice usage, that they're fully aware of their addiction and know that withdrawal equals death. When Paul threatens to destroy spice production, they tell him, you would blind yourself too and condemn us all to slow death. Have you any idea what it means to be deprived of the spice liquor once you're addicted? Access to spice, therefore, becomes the difference between life or death. These are the consequences of spice addiction on an individual level, and they also mirror the larger ecological disruptions that occur in the novel. Ecology is all about the idea of interconnectedness. The changes in one place lead to changes elsewhere, whether or not you expect them. One of the key messages of Dune is that one cannot simply ingest a geriatric psychoactive substance that extends life and expands awareness without consequences. Spice gives, but it also takes. On an individual level at high intakes, it causes people to see themselves and their surroundings in new ways. In this way, spice signals a connection between body and mind and the irreversible consequences on both of ingesting such a potent substance. On a larger scale, just like with real world spices or oil, the demand for spice plays a significant role in politics. The Guild and the Bene Gesserit must ensure they have continuous access to spice and they make political decisions accordingly. It was the Guild that permitted the emperor to succeed his father. And it was the Bene Gesserit that made him agree to place a Bene Gesserit on the throne. A ruler's fate in this universe is inextricably tied to spice. And because spice is only found on Dune, this makes it a key territory for colonial resource extraction. As a driving force for the narrative, spice draws attention to the ripple effects it produces as each faction seeks to ensure its supply and then responds to the actions of others in the interconnected web of the Imperium. On the other hand, we have the Fremen and the Imperial Planetologist, Dr. Liet Kynes, and they have well-intentioned attempts to terraform the planet but it's poised to eventually destroy the ecosystem and spice along with it. Liet's character is a way for Herbert to include an explicit voice of ecology, someone who understands the science and shares his knowledge with other characters and by extension, readers unfamiliar with such concepts. The Fremen demonstrate their willingness to use spice toward their long-term vision of ecological transformation. Even as, even as oppressed peoples, they maintain access to the most valuable currency and successfully leverage it in the political arena. But the Fremen's dilemma remains. How do you terraform the planet without destroying the sandworms? 
and there are hints that this long-term project is flawed. Liet realizes too late that his father and all the other scientists were wrong, that the most persistent principles of the universe were accident and error. Although these cryptic concerns are not resolved in the first book, they point toward a future with a retreating desert and a collapse of the ecosystem that sustains the sandworm life cycle and, crucially, the spice. Liet's insight into ecology and his literal death due to spice conveys the naivety of the notion that a water-filled paradise can coexist with an arid desert full of sandworms. Through the Kynes family, Dune shows that even well-intentioned attempts at manipulating the environment lead to unintended consequences, even the loss of what is most precious to a people. Clearly, Spice and Dune is more than just a psychoactive drug used by characters to alter their consciousness, and it's more than just a stand-in for oil. It's grounded in real world historical and social context, which gives it a significant role in the world building process by enabling us as readers to immerse ourselves in a world that resembles our own, but contains humans who have pushed their potential to extraordinary heights through consumption of this precious substance. Spice is distinct in its combination of addictive, geriatric, and psychoactive properties into one consumable substance that showcases natural enhancements to the mind and body as well as the consequences of addiction and the political actions taken to safeguard its continued production. In addition, as a driving force for the narrative, Spice helps illuminate the principles of ecology and interconnectedness that underpin the novel and contribute to its continuing popularity. Scholar Chris Pack has called Dune one of the most influential examples of ecological science fiction that has informed science fiction discourse and influenced popular culture thus helping to shape science fiction's future ecological vision. Spice is essential as a focal point around which the ecological messages of the novel take shape. And it prompts us to reconsider our own attempts to alter the ecosystem to fit our own desires. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech. We will have some time for a joint discussion after all the speeches in this panel. So uh, let me announce our next speaker that will be Tara Smith, uh, who will have a speech entitled The Tangled Bank of the Oak's Tail, Reading Dune SSN Cone. Tara, I give you the stage. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, no, just give me a moment to set myself up. All right, and can you see my PowerPoint okay? Yeah, it's perfect. Great, okay. Um, so let me just... Okay, thanks everybody. Um, I will get started. Okay. Uh, oh, give me a second. There we go. All right, Herbert's Dune series can be interpreted as a literary con in three different ways. The contradictory nature of the plot, Herbert's self-proclaimed Zen Buddhist religious status, and the allusions in the novel to Zen Buddhism. Herbert alludes to core Zen teachings implicit in the text, the importance of balance, the cyclical nature of his narratives, and the ambiguities that are prevalent in the series. Superimposing all of these exhalations in Zen is the mega motif of the text themselves being written like a Zen koan, an intricate riddle aimed at challenging the reader to question their assumptions, beliefs, and the very reality they inhabit. Herbert, in this sense, is like a Zen master, and we, as the readers, are sitting at his feet, trying to untangle the truths inherent in the text. It is important to acknowledge that Zen Buddhist koan is a very specific entity, normally a phrase or a poem used within Zen Buddhism as an accompaniment to Zazen in order to encourage enlightenment. As such, rather than being a koan in the strictest sense, Herbert is instead drawing on a koan style of contradictory ideas and plots. Herbert's novels thus teach a similar lesson to that used within Zen Buddhism. The didactic style imparts lessons around students, readers developing ideas for themselves, thinking differently and ultimately breaking apart passive readership and forcing the responder to enter into a dialogue with the novel and the narrator. Herbert's content and obvious love and fascination for ecological systems, feedback loops and the interconnectedness and interdependence of all organisms which rely on a state of balance can also be seen reflected in the beliefs of Zen Buddhism. 
In the 9th century, the Chan Zen Buddhist tradition split into two major schools, the Soto school, primarily focusing on Zazen, meditation, and the Rinzai school, utilizing both Zazen and Collins in their teaching. In the Rinzai school, Collins are used as a teaching tool by Zen masters to help their students reach enlightenment more rapidly than just when they just use Zazen, as they can glimpse the idea of dependent origination. Collins are used within many different Zen schools to varying degrees. Generally, it is considered that Collins exists only within the Rinzai school and the Soto school only practices Zazen. This, however, is only partially true. While some contemporary Soto practice Collins are, are very rarely used, the school was established by Zen masters which heavily relied on Collins to challenge the reality of their students. The founding master of the Soto school, Dojun, in the 13th century is well known for his Shobo Genzo, a compilation of 300 columns which focus on the idea that experiences that one experiences in everyday life and is the most fundamental column. The Zen masters Dogen and Hakuen are credited as having brought Zen into Japan, with Hakuen organizing the columns into a system still in use today. Columns within the practice were brought to America from Japan by many different masters, including Haku Kaku Tazen Mazumi, who in 1967 founded the Los Angeles Zen Center. A koan is a short paradoxical phrase or expression used within Zen Buddhism, typically embodying a lesson taught from an enlightened master to an unenlightened student. Um, the aim is to alter the student's preconception, illustrate their ignorance, and provide insights into reality which overcome normal logic. Most columns initially seem nonsensical, or a question may be asked which is given a strange reply. However, the expression of a con after contemplation often reveals greater truths. There are two main bodies of Zen Buddhist columns, uh, the Gateless Gate and the Blue Cliff Record. Textual columns are called cases, and within the text are often accompanied by commentaries and notes made by the Zen masters. Many ideas explored in June are koan-esque. When applying the Cohen methodology to Herbert's work, it is important to navigate the essence of it without detracting from the true meaning of the word. In the 1950s and the 1960s, it did not take long for Zen, with its promises of Asian mysticism and self-focus, to get swept up with the general countercultural American hippie movement. In order to differentiate between the various influences of Zen, the English philosopher Alan Watts described three types of Zen within America, beat Zen, square Zen, and Zen. For Watts, Beat Zen referred to the sort of cool adaptations of seemingly Zen ideas like gaining new perceptions from moving to a new country or walking in the mountains that connect with nature. Square Zen, on the other hand, referred to American practitioners of Zen trying to adapt the East Asian style in their exactness without paying any homage to the changes or the fact that there are differences amongst the schools of Zen. And then there is Zen, which Watts prefers as it returns students to the classic Zen literature as appropriate to the current historical period. Um, and this is just a quote from Children of June. I'll just read it out. Uh, to learn patience in the Ben Jesuit way, you must begin by recognizing the essential raw instability of our universe. We call nature, meaning this totality in all of its manifestations, the ultimate non-absolute. To free your vision and permit you to recognize this conditional nature's changing ways. The Zen Buddhist tenet of the middle path is found extensively within the June series. According to Hein, Zen Buddhism allows for a middle ground between the opposing philosophical ideas of absolutism and relativism, or theism and atheism. This balance is exemplified by the appropriate way in Zen to meditate. As discussed earlier, the practitioner of Zen should not be like the resting stone, passive and asleep, but nor should the seeker be incredibly invested, allowing outside influences to affect the practitioner emotionally. In Zen, any emotional view which may seem reasonable if taken to its extreme conclusion can end up as an obsession. An example of extreme emotion can be seen in June when Paul becomes the Ma'ziv. In this example, during Paul's time in the Sitch Tabia, he develops a close friendship with the members in the Sitch with mutual love, respect, and loyalty. When Paul embraces his role as Ma'ziv, the religious savior with godlike gifts, his friends' respect and uh, his friends' respect and loyalty becomes mindless devotion. Paul mourns the loss of his friends who are now more akin to his apostles. In Herbert's Dune series, extreme ideals and emotions are critiqued and balance upheld, emulating core Zen teachings. 
Hubbard is constantly exploring the problems of extremes in the Dune series, reflecting this key Zen teaching. To better understand the essence of Zen and extremes, it is useful to refer to a particular column which describes a convoluted paradox. The comment is attached to a verse found in the Gateless Gate, case two. The comment poses the contradictory question of whether a Zen master who has removed themselves from karmic laws through enlightenment is then above these laws and thus no longer accountable for their actions. To further explain, the paradoxical query is if the master is above the laws, whether he is therefore capable of doing anything he wants without fear of consequence. But if he is not above these laws, then what does enlightenment mean? To attempt to answer this question, woman Hu Kai, the compiler of the Gateless Gate, summarizes the debate with an equally paradoxical answer. Bound by or free from causality, two sides of the coin, free from or bound by causality, a thousand errors and tens of thousands of mistakes. This column reflects the impossibility of this problem, as no matter whether someone is bound by the causal laws or freed by them, they will commit either a thousand errors or ten thousands of mistakes, meaning that it is all relatively pointless. Women's column teaches the student of Zen not to get stuck on an impasse, unable to move forward by contradictions. This quality of clinging to an extreme view is referred to as the tale of the buffalo, inspired by Case 38, Gozo's Buffalo from the Gateless Gate. The buffalo's tail represents the idea that the buffalo is trying to pass through a window, and whilst it can fit the bigger and bulkier parts through, its tail prevents it from fully passing. The phrase is a metaphor for sticking to an extreme view, which can become like a tail preventing you from moving forward. Herbert deliberately creates a fictional universe that challenges the reader in a Zen fashion. Like a koan used to break the individual from the monotony of their preconceptions, Herbert uses epigraphs and contradictions within the plots to provoke questions within his audience. The reader is asked to question their beliefs and their faith in the goodness of the characters. Just as the Zen student, we are asked to question our extremes and to view the consequences of having any steadfast beliefs. Nothing can be trusted. A possible explanation for this occurs by examining Herbert's love, respect, and position as an ecologist. Ecology as a discipline is obsessed with feedback systems and balance, with reaching an equi equilibrium which, perhaps unsurprisingly, seems similar to the teaching of Zen Buddhism. Behind, Zen is linked to ecology as it incorporates everything within its teaching, just as ecology includes the small sand trout, a desert-dwelling fish-like creature, all the way to the mighty sandworms. In Zen, even a cook is tasked to incorporate their training into cooking, wherein a cook preparing a meal would be told not to leave a single grain of rice uneaten and not a monk left wanting for one more grain. Zen practice is harmonious with ecology because of its promotion of balance, prudence and control. No gain can be left and nobody can be left hungry. Zen can also be linked with the ecology and the environment with the scientific convergence theory. The convergence theory is a scientific idea often understood to reflect the constantly changing nature of becoming, which occurs within particle theory. Instead of the past understanding that particles are stationary, many quantum physicists believe that particles are in fact constantly changing states and waveforms. This belief is shared within Zen ideas as they also believe that everything is a constant motion and change, and is only labelled with the role of the observer. While science is generally believed to exist in isolation of the observer, the convergence theory states that there is always a subjective component within science which impacts the observation. This idea is reinforced within the Zen concept of unity within human beings and nature or individuality and universality. In Herbert's novels, Kynes represents the ultimate scientist, utilizing terraforming to benefit mankind despite the cost from the natural ecosystem. He's an independent observer who, to his folly, removes himself from the equation. The message Herbert makes by killing kinds in the very environment he wishes to change is to remind him of his position within that ecosystem and the impossibility of removing humankind from the environment, a very similar idea as explored in Zen. A poignant example of the epigraph relating to the text in a subtle way occurs in June when the old planetologist like kinds dies in the desert. The epigraph utilized here adds further depth to the scene by including excerpt of poetry to reflect the folly of trying to control the natural world. After aiding Jessica and Paul to escape from the Harkonnens, he is exiled into the desert where he dies. The epigraph, instead of being the general extract from Princess Irulan, is instead a poem titled The Old Man's Hymn from the Kizawa Tafid, an old Arakian religion. The poem is as follows. I drove my feet through a desert whose mirage fluttered like a host. 
Voracious for glory, greedy for danger, I roam the horizons of Al Kalab. Watching time level mountains in search and its hunger for me, and I saw the sparrows swiftly approach, bolder than the onrushing wolf. They spread in the tree of my youth, I heard the flock in my branches, and was caught on their beaks and claws. The poem poetically begins the presentation from which the planetologist, who, with the help of his father, began the slow terraforming project of Arrakis. The poem speaks of an old man reflecting on his youth and the folly of the decisions he once made. This reflects on the stubbornness and gall of kinds who through terraforming begins to do irreversible damage to the ecosystem of the planet. Just as the man in the poem who is ensnared by the beaks and claws of birds representing perhaps time, memories, or his greedy appetites. In the following scene, Kynes unravels as he slowly dies in the desert he was so adamant to control. He repeats to himself, I am like Kynes, I am his imperial majesty's planetologist, I am steward of this land. His identity begins to unravel and his once determined and confident beliefs begin to give him doubts. As he falls and feels the sand under his hands, he thinks, I am steward of this sand. Both the men in the palm and Kynes lose a part of themselves, lost to death, time and memories of a previous folly. No longer sure of their identity. Herbert's narrative technique of the epigraphs throughout the novel do more than just develop his rich and detailed fictional universe. The epigraphs are often poetic, confusing, and have very little continuity. They are not from the same text or even by the same narrator, and thus initially seem to have little to do with the main plot of the novels. However, through an active focus, the epigraphs richly inform and layer the text like short little columns which, if the reader keeps in the back of their mind, slowly reveal their subtle lessons in the often action and plot driven series. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and for your speech. As I can see just a moment ago, uh, our next speaker joined us. Uh, I mean, Eric Wilson. Eric, can you hear us? Eric. Just give us a second to solve the technical problems as usual. Eric, one more check. Can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. So, uh, okay, now it's time for you. You are now online and let me uh, introduce you. Uh, uh, so uh, our next speaker will speak about the infinite capital accumulation through the endless harvesting of unlimited dead souls. Eric, the stage is yours. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. And thanks for inviting me. I'm just going to full screen for a second if we can do that. Yeah, there we are. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, I'm a um, uh, science learner. I do um, uh, law and juridical studies. And so I'm not really that up on doom, but I'm up on things that can be related to a certain take novels, so I'm going to pursue more of a criminological, legal, and political So I'm going to get my comments about Dune per se out of the way, and then up front, and then kind of go into more of the critical thesis that I've kind of developed for today's talk. Now, when I read Dune, uh, when I was first when I was 14, what went through my mind, if I had to put it in one sentence, which I will, is that the lesson of Dune is that in the far future, feudalism will make a comeback, which is kind of an odd result to get from a science fiction novel, but it makes sense in this instance. And from that, I kind of divide that into kind of three takeaways. One, I could argue up to a point that I think there are four, Dune is something of a dystopian novel, but I'm not going to, but a very singular one, not a, by any means, dystopian literature has got its own cadence, its own genre formalities. But I think you can really argue up to a point of this book. Secondly, and I think most importantly, it's anti-teleological. 
That's to say that from a historical perspective, and that's to say that paid modes of class relations will prove more suitable and more radical and radical and so-called progressive models of historical transformation. So it's anti-linear and it's anti-teleological. And the third one is uh, Eric, uh, sorry to interrupt you, uh, I beg your pardon, but we've got some uh, issues with your microphone, uh, with your microphone, I believe. Okay. Uh, could you please um, give it closer to your mouth or something? Oh, like sure. That? Sorry about that. Okay. How's, is that better? Is that, yeah. Is that, okay, thank better. you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm going to look like a goldfish in a bowl. I'm going to put a dupe close to my face. And the third one is that I think that the novel to uh, a kind of McKinsey work like form of radical and vulgar material. And that reemergent political economy is enabled to also purely merit material nature matter. And of course, I really like the conceit of spice, for example, which is, uh, as an LSD, uh, ultra practical interstellar space flight. Uh, Indicative technology that somehow is related to the dichotomy, culmination, privatization, kind of a patrimonial corporatism, which is represented by the two dueling us sovereignty in the House of Orleans. So, with that out of the way, my thoughts about Dune, I'm simply going to um, explicate on the relevance of all of this by referencing a paper that I just uh, had appear in a Russian publication, the Review of Business and Economic Studies of the um, University of Moscow, um, volume, four, uh, volume 4, issue 4 this year. Uh, and if anybody want to have a look on it, it's been available online now. And so I'm going to kind of weave back between what I've got to say about Dune and what and some of the things I raised in that uh, article, because by sheer coincidence, the two projects actually converged. I think this article about the time I was invited to it. I'm going to be drawing upon that. Now, to be living next to the Boston dystopian, and definitely on the left, and probably reflecting a radical materialism, I would then make a huge statement uh, that the hidden history of both the 20th and 20th centuries is a meta narrative, which is an old fashioned term, but I think I can defend it here, is the meta narrative of divergent evolutions of very totalitarianism, building a globalist, territorialized neo totalitarianism So if we take this in the long durée view, and remember Herbert's novel involves tens of thousands of years, so I can do a long durée approach myself. The enlightenment, the essence of the enlightenment, is the, sub is the finding of a substitution for the church, or a kind of a new form of wholly secularized theopolitical structures. And of course, this is the secularization thesis of Karl Lowith. And it's critiqued by Hans Blumenberg. The modern polis or city or state is the simulacrum of the pre modern ecclesia and focused upon two things which are of long term importance uh, the search for a political re religion, which equates to secular dogma, and the evolution of biopolitics, which is a secular form of pastoralism. So the big takeaway of this is that where we get today in arguments, especially over um, the presidency of Donald Trump and then the possible react, reaction against it, seems to be, whose wheels seems to be coming off as well, we get in an argument of whether or not communism is really fascism, whether liberal democracy is really a form of fascism, whether liberal democracy is a form of social democracy, and so on and so forth. But I think that's all a category mistake. Everything in the 19th and 20th century is the search for a sustainable and self-regulating form of totalitarianism or totalitarian democracy, even better, of which communism, fascism, and the current political economy of choice, which is some form of post-Keynesian neoliberalism, are really three different aspects of the same thing. So the current hegemonic mode of political economy, neo-totalitarian democracy, or illiberal post -democracy. Now, um, an interesting comment by Mark Mzauer on this concerning uh, the European Union as an anti-democratic I promise. The irony of that motley collection of European states, or the fascism, really cannot be impeached by inspiration. Um, 
um, as far as how And if we part of the heritage, if we no? Eric, I beg your pardon, but once more something oh. with, uh, with your microphone. <laughs> uh, can we do some check? Uh, sure. Well, now I can hear you perfectly. Oh, now you can hear. Okay. Okay, go on. Thank you. But on the country, seven classes are going to new orders. Europe has a geographic location. But the curriculum is going to be a part of the world's reality. We find that much of the world is driven by the European world field of rule organization. The West is now the former West. Its economy has become something else. Now, if you remember that in um, E.I. Vladimir, Bruce Vladimir, published his book on communism in India, Lenin there was speaking from nationalist triumphalism, revanchism, model revolutionary politics. Okay. Um, the year 1989, Russia really has the politics. The problem is that the future revolutionary politics is some variant of neo-totalitarianism. So basically what I would argue, jumping to the conclusion very quickly, is I don't know whether or not I'm going to be able to continue with the talk if we're having sound problems like this, because I just got another warning, is that in a sense, what we're witnessing today is the return of, shall we say, an anti-teleological, anti-illiberal, older forms of corporate structures and ideologies that are now becoming the new norm and are now being normalized through the process of neoliberalism, which has become the universal economic system. So in that sense, and that's, I think, where my connection with Dune lies, and it, it's a weak one, but it's probably the one that I'm most comfortable dealing with, is because it does reflect this notion of a dysfunctional and possibly dystopian, dystopian approach towards historical evolution, which is as much reactionary as it can be conventionally described as the rest. Uh, okay, now, how is my sound doing? Because I'll rush through very quickly and try to get for, this wrap uh, up. For several, last several um, uh, sentences, it was perfect. Okay. okay so. But now it isn't. Now it's now it's not. How's this? Uh, now it. Uh, now it uh, is. Okay. Now it is. Okay. Um, okay. So I have this being real. Um. Now. And now it isn't. Now it isn't. How's this? Now it is. Oh, now it is. Okay. Now, okay, so basically, I'll, I'll, what I would do is I have to talk very fast, uninterruptedly, at this pitch, so that you can hear the whole thing. Basically, my paper is divided, or my presentation is um, divided. Sorry, Eric, do you have um, your phone that are you using Wi-Fi or data? At the moment, Eric? I'm using Wi-Fi. Is it, do you have data on your phone? Could you switch to maybe come on, on your phone? Sometimes that can be a bit better. I wonder I, whether it's your Wi-Fi connection. It may very well be. Because uh, it's very in and out. So often we'll catch like the first five words and then there'll be nothing yeah. and then you come like, oh, oh, rats. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. No, um, you're right. Okay. Sorry. And now, uh, Eric, pardon, uh, now are these words that we can't hear. But isn't it um, where you have your microphone set? Um, isn't it too close to your face or too far? Since there are some moments that we can hear mm -hmm. you perfectly and some the this sound was... Yeah. Uh, it just may be a connectivity problem. But, you know, I can see that you have uh, perfect uh, yeah. signal strength. So... Yeah. I believe that, that these are other microphone issues. Okay. Um, I, now I've got my mute. Uh, I see my mute icon in the lower left corner. 
and the green is coming up and down as I speak. So it's okay. to be picked up on my side. Here, I see maybe you okay. Maybe you're having a problem with receiving it. Uh, could you please repeat? Uh, well, your... I'm, I'm saying I'm seeing the the green. Uh, okay. I'm seeing the mute. Um, I'm seeing the mute mic on, and I'm probably thinking of having a green uh, as I'm speaking. It's a volume indicator, and it's coming through okay. And then I'm completely stop and now coming back again. So I'm not quite Let me have a look here. Let's do uh, switch to phone audio. Um, now I can't. That doesn't seem to be able to work. I'm sorry about this. Um, should I just discontinue? Because there's no point of me continuing if you're only hearing every half sentence. Uh, but uh, all the all you told now uh, was perfectly <laughs> hearable. I mean, I, I explained perfectly why you can't hear me with 100% audio. So maybe let's give it a try. If okay, you, okay. If it will be so. My papers. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm lost some time, and I know you don't. So I'm going to have to, to zoom through this as fast as I can. Uh, basically, the end of capitalist imagery making series of neoliberal and of This is right, very basically um, the problem of neoliberalism uh, of capitalism. Um, I draw a lot on the work of Mackenzie Ward, who describes herself very proudly as the but she means that in basically in terms of a, a techno-determinist or a techno even uh, historical material. And in her book published by Verso in this year, uh, she talks about post capitalism and the organized plan information in small form, which are imbricated within the totality of a total um, and there are two things I'm going to simply uh, summarize from Work's work, which I use a great deal in my own, is that one, uh, what we call the internet, the entirety of social media, including what we're trying to struggle with Recording right now. Recording in progress. Okay. Um, is that... Recording how, can, stopped. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. Okay, now I've just lost my image of you, uh, but you can still hear me. Yeah, we can still hear yeah. you. Uh, okay, now you're back. Okay. Um, uh, is that the development of institutionalized electronic and digital communications is the result of not the military industrial complex, but the military industrial technological complex? which in fact reflects a kind of an American state of socialism in which all sectors of the research community were actually integrated into a program where the Russian one fell apart because of basically disaggregation. So the Americans were ironically aggregated, the Soviets were disaggregated, both great help and advanced developments in military related communicative technology. But more importantly, this sort of like state military industrial complex which was based upon the techniques of information, gives rise to what work calls vectoralism, which is her response to the notion of an international capitalist class. What we really have in place is an international techno uh, technocratic elite. Uh, the double form gives rise to a mirroring duality of content and property in which what she calls the ruling group, she calls them a class. I think they're more better described as an elite, but what she calls vectoralists who own the extensive vectors of communication which transfer space, as well as the intensive vectors of computation which accelerate time, which is nothing other than Marx's space-time compression symbol head, is that which kills the organic, gives birth to the digital, as an all-conquering double movement from the infinite, now infinite, up to the real, the infinitely expanding frontiers of smaller stuff, and that come ultimately the communication of life itself. And the vector is not just a means of transforming production, is also a way of transforming state power. So, so if pure information in Ross, basic and most pristine formed, can be transformed into a commodity, then in the strict and proper sense of the term that we are all owned. So work, like Herbert, reflects a kind of both a technophiliac and a technophobic approach to modern technology, 
Uh, one of the things that really struck me about Dune when I first read it again as a kid was the way in which in the far future we will impose all kinds of strict criminal or even religious prohibitions against certain forms of anti-humanistic technological development and experimentation. Which is called the so kind of like a semi-underground organ. But the important point for my own work is that the notion of vectoralism and the commodification of pure information, which in a sense is the death of a liberal understanding of humanism, is straight back to basically trends in international politics, international crime, and the international financial economy. So that the wholesale conversion of the capitalist world economy to neoliberalism, which is essentially what has happened, carries within it two pathogens of criminological significance. The first is the globalization of power crime, and the second is the systemic entrenchment of neo-authoritarian forms of government. Both are the bitter of information and velocity and speed and information itself as commodities. And for power crime, uh, this is my definition, and I've worked a lot with a criminologist at the Temple University, Nikos Passas. Fraud, he defines power crime, and I follow him. Power crime is defined as fraud and corruption by elites that have substantial governmental power, economic power, typically as CEOs. Often, of course, they have both forms of power simultaneously. Elite criminals of far greater ability than non-elites to act dynamically to optimize the environment for fraud or neutralizing their crimes psychologically and obtaining opportunity. So when we say neutralizing their crimes psychologically and obtaining substantial opportunity, what does that mean? Well, first of all, passes without using the word does draw an implicit correlation by making it clear between neuroliberalism and effectiveness. And that what he calls elite criminals or criminal sovereignties are best understood who undertake the criminal criminogenic manipulation science system that constitutes the hard wiring of the international. So, vectorism, which is a form of techno material, vulgar materialistic technological discrimination facilitates the transformation of the whole of the real into the holy virtual form of reality, supersedes all forms of common sense, which can then be criminogenically manipulated to basically undermine the conventional, liberal, progressive, optimistic, enlightenment understanding of the dem demarcation between crime and law. And that of no less importance is the notion of the a new hierarchical division of social and technological power, particularly with regard to mass media, which gives rise to, a, to another important concept, which is called criminogenic asymmetries. The criminogenic asymmetries are structural dysfunctions, mismatches, and inequalities in the sphere of politics, culture, the economy, and the law. Asymmetries are criminogenic in that they create opportunities for the profit, produce or strengthen the demand for illegal goods and services generate incentives for actors to participate in illegal transactions, and reduce the ability of authorities to control illegal activities. So if you put all that together, if you combine vectoralism with criminogenic asymmetries, both of which in some way are and have entered into a symbiotic, I don't want to quite say dialectical, but a symbiotic relationship with global neoliberal then what you've got is kind of the emergent paradigm of sub-state or non-state private actors who are actually able to accumulate financial and a kind of an extra judicial form of political power that is roughly or highly approximately um, resembling what we would call a kind of a privatization of sovereignty or perhaps a form of post-legal criminal sovereignty, which in fact is not by any means, dissimilar to Herbert's notion of corporate patrimonialism or patrimonial corporate. And uh, the third point, because I'm probably running very low on time, uh, but I'll sort of get to the, the big point, the last major point that I have to make, is that the relation between all of this and why we can regard possibly, I'm going to really go on a limb and argue, though, why we call feudalism, as actually a model for future, uh, or at least near future, planetary developments. Um, if we look at the way, so I'm just simply going to summarize what I've got. 
If we look at the way that we understand international relations, especially what we would call from a classical realist perspective, great power or big power relationships, we notice that a great deal of interstate behavior is based upon mimesis, uh, that lesser states will imitate more successful states quite deliberately because states, just like people in the Hegelian sense, are struggling with each other for recognition by others. It's sort of the master-slave dialectic applied to international politics. And some theorists, like Emmanuel Wallerstein and modern world systems theory, have proposed that what we would call hegemony has a cultural dimension to it, which is that the hegemon, if we go through history and we look at and we assume that states exist in systemic operational interactions, that the world system is actually a system properly so-called, that state actors will actually follow each the other that seems to be the most successful. And the state at any given moment in time who is the one who is most commonly imitated or copied is the state that deserves to be called, denoted as the hegemon or the leader. So leadership is not just a military, political, or economic phenomena. It's also a cultural phenomena as well, that it is the state to be followed. France in the 18th century, England during the Victorian era and the Edwardian era, every state in the world is trying to become like France or England at some point. The... 20th century, that became the United States for all of the obvious reasons. But we would argue that, and since everyone in the United States on my side of the lake is wringing their hands about the possibly the beginning of the end of our hegemony, uh, we're arguing who the next hegemon should be. And of course, everyone is talking about China, but that is merit. But I'm just wondering whether or not, in a certain sense, Russia wouldn't be actually, or actually Eastern Europe in some ways wouldn't be a better model for the new hegemon. Because if vectoralism, the essence of the essential characteristics of vectoralism, check out. And if we have an international economy that's fostering through criminogenic practices and manipulations of mass media and represent and high-speed representation, velocity of information, now completely and totally commodified. And then both of those things give rise to kind of like semi-autonomous private actors of a form of sovereignty, then it would therefore rather perversely, but logically be the outcome that the state that most merits the wearing the mantle of hegemony is the one that is actually the most advanced in developing post-liberal, anti-democratic, neo-authoritarian, oligarchic structures. And the more that neoliberalism is successfully globalized, implemented, and of course imitated by other states, then those states will in fact be, within this particular understanding of international behavior, the leading states. And of course, therefore, the greatest hegemon should in some ways be considered what used to be known as the Soviet Union. Now, the breakthrough moment in this development, if the development has merit to it, is of course the European Union. Because the thing about the European Union is that for all of its policy progressivism, and in many ways it is a very progressive international organization, an IGO, at the same time, as we all know, it's considered to be very undemocratic in a lot of ways. Uh, in many ways, it's more of an administrative entity rather than a political entity in the classic and certainly not in the classic liberal or democratic. But what the success of the European did after 1989 was, of course, invite the states of Eastern Europe in to join the party through a process that was in many ways extraordinarily unfair and impatient. But since the European Union invited the states of Eastern Europe into the club, it allowed the states of Eastern Europe to actually engage in their own form of imitation. Since they were already very undeveloped in terms of democratic policy, for the obvious reasons, they were therefore more pre-inclined to move towards a neo-authoritarian oligarchic form of political activity. And Secondly, 
since the eastern states, the eastern members of the European Union were, were essentially, to basically summarize it in one sentence, humiliated by being forced to comply with a purely Western model of statehood, which was by no means indigenous <laughs> to them, and continuously criticized for failing to be proper versions of then this, of course, provoked a populist reaction. And of course, this reactionary so-called right-wing uh, or neo-rightist, far-right extremist neo-populism, of course, is one of the things that's causing a great deal of political anxiety in the West. Because it does seem to be quite anti-teleologically something that has possibly emerged as a sustainable and attractive model of political economy and organization. So I'll simply read uh, my last two pages, and then I'll have, simply, I'll have to wrap it up because I'm probably out of time. So here is the truth that is simply too painful for Western liberals to handle. Can you hear me still? Now we are still, but when you were announcing uh, this about your last two pages, there were some issues. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but you hear me? I'll, say, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just wrap it up. Here is the truth that is simply too painful for Western liberals to handle. The future arrived first in Russia, rendering everything that may have transpired between Russia and Trump of secondary importance and a guilt by process. <laughs> Excuse me. What is process of national convergences driven by mirroring elite criminal oligarchies? In Russia, the 89% of total household wealth in 2016. In the United States, it was 76%. In terms of political economy, the oligarchies are virtually identical in regards to structural inequalities they would see. In terms of discussions and government apparatus, they differ slightly. Basically, liberal technocratic elitism in the U.S., right-wing nationalist populist culture with its effective opposite both. So the uncanny convergence of the neoliberalism of energetic agencies and vectorism from themselves is sufficient to neo neo-authoritarian oligarchy. As Vladimir Gazinsky, the ultimate Russian oligarch mass media opponent, the oligarch and the special species which only have been born in Russia in the late 1990s. We came out of the Soviet system but we retain that system and, that remar and the remarkable criminality in the country. <laughs> we were people with fangs going to them. And as a party of comments after 16 years of socialism, feudalism seemed like a step forward. The oligarchs taking a hard Soviet was copycat Vladimir Putin that what is on, not on TV does not exist. Under Putin, Russia exported nothing to the United States. And it re exported. Even better, the Russian people became co Soviet a breath before the whole world went to everything, revealing that the great drama of Russia is not the transition from communism and capitalism between one firmly held set of beliefs and another, but that during the final decades of the USSR, no one believed in communism and it carried on living as if they did, and now they can only create a society of simulations, which is a perfect recipe for power plant, which is a perfect recipe for criminal sovereignty which is a perfect recipe for oligarchic patrimonial corporatism. The exact same, of course, is true for the people of the West, for there is no alternative to neoliberalism and all that comes with it. The only question is the one asked by Peter Pomerantz. What if Russia had been a pre-echo in the list of thing once known as Russia? Russia appears as progress, which, of course, takes me back to doom. Because in the end, progress will be, at least political progress, which is the only thing I'm even remotely confident to talk about here, political progress may in fact resemble by the weird, canny logic or reason of history, feudal or neo-feudalistic political, social, and economic structure. So here's how it works. My big summary, and I hope you can hear all this and I'll tell you. The U.S. as the liberal, classic, more or less classical liberal, or the Keynesian head, manifested in neo Keynesians, both founded on the right side of the as Hillary Clinton. Seeing now in hindsight, 
dynamic of unrestricted globalized primitive accumulation, which is feudalism. The is criminal. He is inherently inclined towards criminality. The fascist movements in the atmosphere was a neoliberal revolution, which was not, in fact, revolutionary, especially reactionary. The return of and hence the unbounded the future European Union after 1989. The newly liberated the because they were needed to gain and were very quickly able to get ahead of the curve. Neoliberalism is everything. National theater, the authoritarian political system, which we can call that either in the technocratic or populist. There is the impact. Every, uh, pardon, I'm afraid it's getting worse. Um, okay. And, better, and um, we can hear only single words. Okay, sorry about that. Mm, and I'm not sure what to do in this case. Yeah, but, me neither, so I can't seem to... But don't you mind, uh, I have a suggestion for you, maybe. Um, maybe it would be possible to, uh, that uh, you will record uh, your oh, speech sure. and we'll rearrange things and put, uh, put the proper version uh, at our services on YouTube and Facebook. Oh, well, that's a bit great. Okay. Good work for you. Can you okay, that's right. Look, can you hear me right now? Yeah, now okay. I hear you <laughs> I, basically what, what's coming through is is the technical assistance, but not the actual substance of the paper, right? Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I know I know how it works now. I, I got it figured out. Okay, I'll tell you what. Contact me. If it would be trying and tell you it didn't work, and then it, you'd start to talk and it would work again. <laughs> like every right. Time. Okay, well that that's divine justice through tech high tech. Okay, uh, here's what we'll do. Contact me, set up a recording. I'll just record it in a nice, steady, leisurely pace, and then you just post it. Yeah, so you just post it and maybe uh, even put it, paste it uh, here within um, in the place of your uh, of your sure. speech. So I mean, can you do that? Speech. Can you do that technically? Because this this is really this is really kind of awkward. I know. No, if you uh, do that, if you can do it, that's that's fine. Uh, I. I you know, uh, not I'm you not necessarily, Mark. There's some matters, maybe somebody can. Well, I hope that uh, our technical staff will be able to do so, but you know, I can't promise that. No, that's so okay. If you allow, let us maybe let us uh, finish this way. But maybe since you are now sounding great, maybe you'll try speaking from this uh, from this posture and uh, and finish this presentation. Okay. Maybe uh, let's give it one last chance. Okay. <laughs> the place where feudalism appeared as progress. Did you hear that part? Yeah. No. Okay, okay, you, you got that part. Okay. Actually, my conclusion is about I was stupidly kind of I'm trying to and now, unfortunately, unfortunately. Okay, now I'm no. gone again. Okay. Yeah, so just email me and set up a recording session if we can, and I'll simply record my talk and we can try to post it. Okay, let's do so. No problem. But even though, thank you a lot for your speech and for all that we were able to hear. Okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, our last speakers didn't join us. Uh, oh. Because of that, uh, we have more time for the discussion. And um, our speakers hold this privileged position and can ask the question for each other. So uh, if you have any, then go on. I have a question for Tara. How how much do you think readers of Dune get the Zen elements? Especially I'm thinking like Western readers. And is that is that a limitation of what Herbert's trying to do? Is that he builds all these cool things, but maybe a lot of them go over our heads? 
Yeah, thanks, Carl. That's a really good question. Because I actually read Dune the first time um, and didn't really pick up on a lot, right? I love the book, but I, I kind of put it aside. And then when I was going to do my honors project, I um, I was originally going to try and do, because I'm in a religion faculty, I was actually going to try and write about um, L. Ron Hubbard's science fiction work before he wrote Dianetics and look at the kind of Scientology religious thing. And I picked up, um, but it was at Battlestar Earth or whatever his major like work is. Um, it was so bad. I was like, no, I'm not doing honestly, it's on this shit sci fi. No offense if anybody's a fan. Um, anyway, so then I was like, what book do I love? And I was like, June. And then I reread it. And as I reread it, I got so much more out of it from the first time reading it. And I was like, this is so cool. And then I was like, and I was trying to like piece it together. I'm like, is it this? Is it that? And I'm like, oh, he's done it intentionally to make it super unclear what the main messages are. And I love that. And so then I kind of looked in and I found out he was a Zen Buddhist. So I was like, ah, it kind of really clicked. And I kind of explored Zen more and this idea of a call and kind of make it like a riddle. Because I think he, he is didactic without being super like um, kind of like to the point of what he's trying to say. Like it kind of allows room for the reader to really develop their own ideas. Because every time you read, you're like, I love Paul. And then you're like, oh, I actually hate Paul. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, I love, you know, the desert. It's so cool. And I love that they're terraforming. And the lady, like, why are they terraforming? It's horrible. And so these kind of like back and forths really help me kind of think that he's doing something quite clever with it. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, I'd say I think the average reader probably isn't reading it the first time around. You're probably just thinking this is a great book, and then as soon as you read it a second time, you start to think about it more. I reckon you get more of those juicy little elements. Thank you. Kara, uh, are you satisfied with this answer? Yes. <laughs> OK, any other questions? I totally agree. Um, I think that's true for a lot of elements, like um, the other religious elements. And then like the older you get and the more you know, the more you realize how many layers are in the book. And it just, I'm still finding new things. I'm like, wait a minute, I don't remember reading this, you know? And it's like, oh, I was there the whole time, but there was just so much. You can't pick it all up in one or two or even multiple readings. Yeah, I've got a question for you, Kara. Um, so I know in your, your work, you look a lot at the... Um like Jean Besser, like Jean Besser, or that, why did I lose the name? Anyway, you look at the, the female like characterizations in June. I'm just wondering whether you think like Frank Herbert portrays women in like a kind of nuanced way or whether there's like room for that him to kind of um, make more progressive female characters. What did you think about that? I think they're definitely a lot more nuanced than some people give them credit for. Um, Herbert uses a lot of archetypes in Dune, it's true, but I think he uses the archetypes as a starting point and then he builds up around that. And so um, even say the Reverend Mother that does the Gom Jabbar test, right? Some people, I think, mistakenly just see, oh, she's, she's this woman who wants to do this kind of mean thing to Paul. But then when you look at their dialogue, you know, she's actually explaining and teaching and guiding him a lot, just like Jessica does. And, you know, you know, kind of be encouraging and not encouraging at the same time. And so she's she's not just a static, you know, mean old character. She does help kind of guide him into the next stage of his journey. But she's and then she comes back at the end. Right. But she's she's got uh, multiple alliances. She's got duties to the emperor, but she's also Benny Gesserit. She also cares about Jessica. So she's a she's got conflict, just like Jessica's conflict and. Um, and Arulan, right, we get those epigraphs, which are sometimes contradictory or sometimes saying things you're like, well, that's from her perspective, but maybe that's not actually true. And she's building that legacy. So um, I think it, it was, I mean, certainly for the time, um, really quite developed characters. But I think they even still today, you know, Jessica, to me, is very relatable and seeing, seeing the turmoil she goes through and seeing her change her mind and feeling conflicted and those are all things we can relate to because those are things that we go through as well. Thank you. Any other questions? And if not, I have questions for Kara and for Tara uh, from our audience uh, at Krakow. And uh, maybe I will put it on your chat. So if I may first, Kara, please have a look. On what, I, uh, on what I sent you, and if you could please read it and answer. Should I read it out loud? Uh, yeah, if you could, please. 
Uh, what is your impression why one of the main subjects of the Dune Saga is a psychedelic? Do you think it changed the impact of the book? Why so much to have who are psychedelic at the heart? I think ahead of us, as with many things, the cultural movement had not the full swing by the time that it was published. And I think what he was really interested in was humans. So he was really interested in humans. This is why Dune is a very low technological society and, and universe. And so I think why he was interested in the psychedelic is it brings out things in the human mind and the human awareness in a way that we usually can't get without the aid of some kind of substance, right? So there's things like runner's high and um, say mothers have, you know, feeling certain, you know, good feelings when they, you know, complete a certain amount of run or, or having a child and things. But otherwise humans oftentimes turn to some kind of substance for, for feeling good or, or expanding their mind. Um, you know, sometimes in safe context, sometimes they're not so safe. So I think for him putting spice in there as this hallucinogen was a way for him to plausibly show us a character like Paul, who's exploring the world and exploring his mind, pushing the limits, gaining access to things that normal people can't get access to, but in a way that was kept it with, kept it more within science fiction rather than going off into fantasy. So it's not just a completely random magical ability that he has. It's sort of tethered. It's tethered with that drug into something that we know in the real world, people do have trips. People do have visions. People do use drugs as a way to have religious experiences, mystical experiences, spiritual experiences. And so we can see Paul and we can say, oh yeah, actually that's something that happens to people. You know, he's pushed it beyond the limits of what we know, but maybe someday, you know, we will be able to also push ourselves. In terms of the impact of the book, I think, I think that's one of the things that gives it that staying power is because it's not magical and it's not technological. It's through kind of a natural substance. And if, if you're paying attention to what's happening with um, micro dosing of LSD, you know, it's finally kind of coming back into being used for therapeutic purposes to sometimes really great results. And things like cannabis, uh, marijuana starting to be decriminalized in certain places around the world. So we're kind of seeing a shift back into looking at, well, yeah, how do drugs affect us? And should we maybe not have them be illegal, you know, things like alcohol, which cause a lot of issues have been legal for a long time. So why are those things legal? And yet these other things aren't. And so I think the, the impact that it has is it's, it makes the world believable and it, make, it makes Paul more of a believable character going through his journey than if he just kind of made up some random thing that like, oh, you take this and suddenly you're off in another, another world. So that's, that's why. Tara, do you have any, anything to add to that? Um, pardon if I may, um, but the, um, to continue this question, um, since, you know, we don't have any contact, personal contact uh, with people sitting uh, in Krakow, but don't you think it is a, it can be seen as kind of eulogy of drugs? So, you know, the spice extends life, it gives you power, etc., etc. So, um, wasn't that Herbert presented uh, the spice as something very positive? Yeah, but but there's there's a cost to it. So the cost is really Paul's kind of mental ability to kind of live in the moment, right? So he just starts like living in that future and being controlled by the future. And he really has very little control by the end of the book. And he even admits, you know, I'm not going to be able to control the jihad. So I think throughout the book, we see him on the journey and we see his awareness expanding. And then it's kind of like, it sort of starts closing in the past that he has. It starts closing in things. And, and the consequences you're addicted. You, you have to always be around the spice. You have to always take the spice. And um, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's not completely presented as positive. It's, and, and if we look at the, the guild, right? The guild, they're so obsessed with the spice that they, you know, they 
you know, if you, if you keep reading into Dune Messiah, they have to like live in a tank, you know, they're just completely addicted to the drug and don't really have any sense of anything else. You know, they don't enjoy things. They just, it's just about the spice to them. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's one of those things, like Tara said, like Herbert's kind of showing us one thing and then kind of twisting it on us at the same time. And, and he's more ambiguous. He doesn't give us a clear, this is good, this is bad. He lets us kind of see for ourselves and make up our own minds about, about those things. Mm, yeah, like you say, Kara, I definitely don't see it as a pro-drug or pro-psychedelic text. I, I mean, I, I think you just look at any monologue by Paul and just how much she's suffering throughout. Like, it doesn't look like a good time. I'm, I'm not reading it being like, Paul, like, I want, I want in on that. It just seems awful. Like, he has no, he doesn't have, he seem to have much autonomy. It's like once that one dib kind of trajectory goes, he, he has no power anymore. So I think it definitely, like, isn't looked at as, like, this, um, this amazing trip that you could go on. I, I think that Herbert, if anything, is almost the other way and saying that, like, be careful what you wish for. Is this really what you want? You know, so that's how I, I still love you, Kara. Uh, Kara, can uh, you have you? Okay, yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah, so the question was, I look like if there was any Eastern theme, do you think it would at all? Um, so um, I thought this was a really interesting question, uh, and I think you could take out the Eastern philosophy, just like you could take out the ecological themes, you could take out like a lot of Herbert's like kind of subliminal, not subliminal, but like deep messaging throughout the text. But I think if you took out any of those elements, it would really, the text would suffer as a whole, because I think that those, that need for balance and this promotion of a balanced lifestyle, whether that's, you know, um, balancing the spice balance in the eco ecological systems is so prevalent throughout that I think you would lose a lot of that. And I do believe that good science fiction is social fiction and it ha does have that didactic element. Um, obviously, entertainment is important, but if you can actually entertain but also um, teach and uh, get promote kind of very good, like, you know, new thinking or critical thinking in your reader, I just think that it's just so much better. And I think this book does that amazingly. So I think, yeah, you could take out those elements. You could make it more like a space opera, which was more about entertainment. And, yeah, it would be a great book, but it wouldn't be as impactful. And I don't think we'd be talking about it in a philosophy conference now if it was the case. So I think it's like you can take it out, but it would suffer if you took out those elements. Great. Thank you. And uh, Eric, uh, who is unable to speak, wrote uh, one question for both of you. So... Um, Oh, did you want me to read it out? If you, you could. Want... Yep. Um, to what degree can June be read as a dystopian novel? Do you want to start with that? Sure. Yeah, this is a tricky one. Because um, when I think about other dystopian novels that are a lot more obviously dystopian, say like Handmaid's Tale, it it's it's again that Herbert is really layering his messages in and it's not it's not as obvious so i think especially the first time you read it like i wouldn't call it a dystopian novel right we have a, we have this young boy and he goes on this hero's journey and you see him rise up to to take the top spot by the end of the book right like how could that be dystopian but but then when you look more carefully and you look at what he's going through and the, what he's thinking about and this jihad that's coming and all this destruction and then the ecological layers and wait a minute, like, how are you going to have all this water? And then you also want to have sandworms. Like, how can you have both at the same time? Um, there's definitely threads in there. But I wouldn't call it a dystopian novel on the whole, just because, to me, it doesn't fit very nicely into that category. But I think you could definitely make an argument for it. I agree with you, Carl. And like a typical Zen Buddhist way, I'm saying it's neither utopic or dystopic. Because I don't, I honestly don't think it is, and I think you're right. When you first read the first novel, you're like, "This is great," you know, "This is such a cool setting, again, terraform. It's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be water. Everything's gonna be great." And then you realize what detrimental effects it has on the sandworms and the ecosystem of the planet, and you're like, "Oh, it's awful." And so I think that I would not call it either a dystopic or utopic novel. And if anything, if I had to, if you think you have to pick one, I'd actually say it's more utopic than dystopic, personally. Uh, just in the, the positive messages of ecology, environmentalism that Herbert imbues with it. But that's sort of my take on it. Uh, but I wouldn't describe it as dystopic personally. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I can't see any other questions, so let me thank you a lot for all your speeches. Uh, I hope to meet you again, and I will. Uh, and now we are having a break. So thank you a lot, and stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you a lot. Bye. Bye. Uh, see you. Bye. See you.